Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Welcome back to Spanish Lessons with Professor Jason. It's good to have you with me again today. What I would like to address in today's lesson is something that's probably been a challenge, um, something you've wondered about if you've been learning Spanish on your own or taking lessons, and it has to do with that little two-letter particle, se. You've probably noticed that it pops up a lot all over the place in Spanish, and it's not always clear to learners why that is and how it functions. So what I want to do today is, as the title suggests, go over the multiple uses of the seemingly omnipresent particle, se, in Spanish. My plan is to give you lots of examples, use the whiteboard so you can sort of see how things work, and sort of go through various of these most common uses of this particle, se. And I'm going to start off explaining when we use se with a written accent. So let's take a look at these two uses. Ah, whoops, I'm not exactly sure how that got on there. Let me let me erase that little cheap plug. All right, so we're going to look at the uses of se when it has a written accent. Okay, when it has a written accent. Se is a form of the verb ser. Okay. Se is a form of the verb ser, equivalent of the second person singular command be in English, as in, for example, be nice right? Be nice, be more respectful, etc. This form of say appears only with affirmative second person singular or, in other words, two commands that are affirmative. Let's take a look at two or three examples. I could say, for example, say más respetuoso. Say más respetuoso or say Firme. No cambies de idea. Okay. Be firm in your convictions. Don't change your idea. Sé más romántico. Sé más romántico si quieres que ella salga contigo. Okay, so just a couple observations. First of all, we're using se as the equivalent of be in the affirmative familiar to command. Be more respectful, be firm, don't change your idea, be more romantic. Notice, however, that if we have a negative command, we just use the subjunctive form. So, first use of say with an accent, form of the verb to be, ser, in the affirmative to command, be this way, be that way. All right, let's look at a second use of say with an accent. Say is the first person singular, right? We do a little verb conjugation chart. First person singular, uh, or yo form, of the verb saber to know. Okay, so it's yo sé, and I'm sure many of you do already know this. An example of this use would be something like yo sé su número de teléfono. Yo sé. Or sé que ella vive en Texas. Okay, o oh, in the negative, no sé a qué horas termina la película. Excuse my handwriting. So, quite simply, the second use of say with a written accent is the first person singular in the present tense of the verb saber, the equivalent of I know. Okay, well that takes care of the simple part of the presentation, the explanation of the uses of say when it carries a written accent, right? We're talking about the uh, affirmative to commands and the present tense yo form of the verb saber. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first use we're going to cover of say when it doesn't carry a written accent, okay? So first of all, we're going to talk about say is the pronoun used with reflexive constructions when verbs are conjugated in the third person singular or plural. 
Okay, now we can see this very clearly if we conjugate a reflexive verb in all the subject positions in the present tense. Let's take a look at one of these verbs. So we would have, if I just want to write quickly the uh, subject pronouns here, uh, see, si, nosotros, vosotros, and ustedes, and the other plurals. Okay, so we would have a me, te, se, nos, os, se, I'll just write in the verb forms real quick. Me levanto, I get up, te levantas, se levanta, he or she gets up, nos levantamos, os levantáis, and ellos, o ustedes, o ellas, se levantan, se levantan. Okay, so you can clearly see that when we're looking at third-person forms of reflexive verbs, verbs in reflexive constructions, we're going to have the particle se introducing those forms. And I'm giving you examples here in the present tense, but obviously this would apply to any tense. So, for example, if I wanted to talk about yesterday, right? Ayer, ella se levantó a las siete. Or I could talk about tomorrow, right? Pero mañana se, still referring to ella in this case, se levantará, future tense, a las diez. A little bit later, she'll be happier, probably. Or I could talk about, use it in the imperfect tense or any other tense, right? Ellos se levantaban, in this case the imperfect, levantaban tarde. They used to get up late. Now, the reflexive pronoun se, in conjunction with these reflexive uh, constructions, is also going to be attached when the reflexive verb is not even conjugated or if the gerund or present participle form is used. That gerund, present participle, I'm talking about things like endings like this. So let's look at a case when it wouldn't even be conjugated. If I wanted to say, ella no quiere, ella no quiere levantarse. So in a situation where this verb is not required to be conjugated, we still have se, it's just attached to the end of the infinitive, or using this construction here, ellos, oops, ellos, se están levantando. I can say it that way. Ellos se están levantando. I can also take this se and, like I mentioned before, attach it. Ellos están levantándose. Okay? So the se is going to be there regardless of our conjugation or lack of conjugation if we're using a reflexive construction. Okay, at this point, that's all I really want to say about the reflexives. Keep in mind that these are just going to be sort of mini introductions to each of the uses. I'm not going to develop any one of them at great length. Okay, it's just meant to be an overview. So, um, let's go on to the next use, okay? Se is used to introduce reciprocal actions involving two or more third-person actors, okay? One particular kind of reflexive usage, so this is related to the reflexives, but one particular kind of reflexive usage is sometimes referred to as the reciprocal reflexive. That's what some people call it, which is what we see when two or more people do something to each other. For example, if Juan kisses Ana and Ana likes it and kisses him back, we could say, say Juan y Ana se besan. Okay? Always conjugating in the third person plural because we have a combined plural subject. And the Se, with the verb besar, a verb that by its nature is reciprocal, we at least hope, tells us that yes, they're doing it to each other. We could also say, as we just mentioned in the previous segment, um, Juan y Ana, without conjugating the verb besar, Juan y Ana quieren, conjugating this verb querer, besar se. 
So even in a situation where the main verb isn't conjugated, we still need to say to express that reciprocity. Quieren besarse. Even if it's ongoing in sort of the present progressive time frame. Juan y Ana están besándose. Okay. Again, we have the plural form of the verb, this dual combined subject, and the se indicating reciprocity of the kissing action. Let's look at a couple more examples. Sometimes that lipstick is hard to get off, guys. All right, let's look at a couple more examples um, with this reciprocal reflexive use of se. I could say, for example, that my sisters, mis hermanas, se escribían. Okay, and again, so we're talking about se escribir. We're using the plural ending, se escribían. This happens to be the imperfect tense, right? My sisters used to write to one another. They used to write to each other. Or I could say, um, Paco y María se ven cada verano. Or a different verb, perhaps, se encuentran, they meet up. Okay. But basically express the idea that Paco y María um, see each other, right? See each other. Again, the plural form, combined, dual subject, cada verano, right? So those are just a couple more examples of the um, reciprocal reflexive use of the particle se. Okay, now a third use of se we could talk about is that se is used as an indirect object pronoun in third person double object pronoun constructions. I'm going to unpack this for you and give you some examples so that that will make sense. Don't worry. But what I mean is that in constructions in which both the indirect and direct objects are expressed as pronouns, the indirect object pronouns, le and les, are going to be replaced with the particle se. So I'll show you some examples of how this works. Okay, so what we have here are three sentences, and hopefully you can make out my very small handwriting because they had to be a little bit long, in which we have subjects, direct objects, and indirect objects. I want to demonstrate how the indirect object pronoun, we have one in each, le, les, and again, les down here, how that's going to become se when we reduce these direct and indirect object pronouns down and into shorter sentences. So, Paco le dio el regalo a sus padres, which means Paco a su padre, excuse me, that should be singular. Paco le dio el regalo a su padre, okay? What we have here is the present, which is our direct object, okay? We have a su padre, which is also represented earlier with le. If I wanted to simply say, he gave it to him, he gave it to him, I would say Paco, instead of le, lo, okay, because this would be lo, okay, we have le and lo. What we're going to say is, that le is going to become se, Paco, se, lo, dio. So that's what I'm talking about when I say the indirect object pronoun, which was les, becomes or is converted to se when it precedes a direct object pronoun, and we're using object pronouns for both. Take a look at the second example. Mi madre les compró las camisas a mis hermanas. Mi madre les compró las camisas a mis hermanas. So she bought the direct object, last, the shirts, for a mis hermanas, for my sister. If I want to just simply say, she bought them for them, I'm going to say, mi madre se, which is the lace being converted, se las compró. Se las compró. Notice something very important in both cases, right? Se refers to to whom or for whom, and it's invariable. It's se. The lo or the las, we can have an s if it's something plural, okay? and it refers to the thing being purchased, the thing being given. Okay. Another important thing to notice is the order, right? It's indirect object pronoun and then direct object. Se lo, se las. Final example. La maestra está leyéndoles un cuento a los niños. The teacher is reading a story to the children. So we have our indirect object to the children. We have our direct object, a story. So the direct object pronoun for a story would be lo. 
and we know the indirect object for pronoun for to the children would be les. So if I just want to say the teacher is reading it to them, I would say la maestra la maestra está leyendo se lo. Se lo. Again, that se comes from les, which represented a los niños, and lo comes from el cuento. So again, le or les, indirect object pronouns representing to whom or, or for whom are going to become se and precede a direct object pronoun. Okay, and let's take a look at yet another use of the particle se. Se is used in passive constructions, passive voice constructions, where no agent is expressed. This is sometimes called the se passive. In Spanish, as in English, lots of ideas can be expressed by using either active or passive voice constructions. What does this mean exactly? Let's go to the whiteboard. Okay, so in active voice constructions, we have a subject that acts upon an object with the word order typically, typically being subject, verb, object. A couple of examples. La cantante grabó las canciones. The singer recorded the songs. Cervantes escribió la novela. Cervantes wrote the novel. In these examples, we clearly see the subject, verb, object, word order, right? Subject, verb, object. But notice also that with the active voice, the subject, right? The subject um, also coincides with what we could call the agent, okay? So the subject is also the agent in active voice sentences, meaning the person actually carrying out the action. Now we can express these same ideas in a different way by using passive voice constructions. Okay, passive voice construction. So, to do so, we convert the original object, okay, the object from the original sentence, which would be, in the first case, las canciones, and la novela. We convert that object into the subject of our new passive voice sentence. Then we use a verb, a form of the verb, to be, ser, many, many times in the past or preterite tense, las canciones fueron, La novela fue, okay? Plus the past parts to form of the main verb. Our verb here was grabar. She recorded the songs. Here it was escribir. We're going to take the past parts to form grabadas. Or la novela fue escrita. Okay, canciones and novela are both um, feminine. Okay? which uh, in this case are past participle forms, grabada, escrita, are functioning more like adjectives. So both the form of the verb, to be, fueron y fue, and the adjective, the adjective past participle forms must agree in number and gender with the subject. So we, here we have a singular feminine, la novela fue escrita, and a plural feminine, las canciones fueron grabadas. Okay, so, um, we can add, okay, we can add the agent using por la cantante in this particular form. Down here we can also add por Cervantes, okay. So this is what I sort of call the, the ser passive, ser plus past participle version of the passive. Let's take a look at one more example. Let's say we had an active voice, an active voice construction that said something like la empresa, the company, la empresa um, exportó, exportó los productos. Again, subject, verb, object, and the active voice. La empresa exportó los productos. Okay, so again, you remember that if we want to make this passive, using this ser passive, we're going to take our object, make that the new subject, los pro productos, take our form of the verb ser, make it agree with the new subject, fueron, take our main verb from the, from the active voice, make it a past participle form that agrees with the subject, 
fueron exportados, and then we can tack on that agent, which is no longer the same as the subject, but we can still add it at the end using the preposition por. Okay? La empresa exportó los productos. Another way to say that, los productos fueron exportados por la empresa. Okay? So, at this point, at this point, you should be asking, okay, what does all this have to do with the particle say? Right? What does this entire discussion on the um, passive voice have to do with the particle say? Well, let's take a look. Um, there's another common form of the passive voice that we can use when we don't need to make reference to the agent, okay? When we're not going to mention who's going to carry out the action, but we only want to emphasize what that action is or was. This is often referred to as the say passive construction. Okay, So let's, let's look at the same examples as we did before. Right? If we have like, la cantante grabó las canciones. We're back to our active voice version. La cantante grabó las canciones. Okay, So, as with the passive voice constructions we just saw, the direct object indeed becomes the new subject. So, las canciones is now the subject, right? Las canciones. So, any verb is going to agree with the subject always in Spanish. Las canciones. What we're going to do is we're going to indicate this is this is now a passive sentence by using the particle say and the verb but making that verb se grabaron making that verb agree with this subject las canciones se grabaron okay or we had before cervantes in the active voice escribió la novela we're going to take la novela, our new subject, used to be the object, now it's the subject, and we're going to say, se escribió. So notice what's missing in these cases. We're missing the agent. We're not making any mention of the singer. She's gone. Cervantes, he's been gone for hundreds of years. Okay. And even if we looked at the other sentence, right? La empresa exportó los productos. Los productos se exportaron. Again, this verb form agrees with the subject. We have singular here, la novela, plural, exportaron los productos. Okay, so the agent is missing. No more cantante, no more Cervantes, no more la empresa. Although we can add on other details. We could say, for example, la novela, Se escribió en 1605, speaking of, of course, the first edition of El Quijote. Or, los productos se exportaron a Estados Unidos. Okay. O, las canciones se grabaron en el estudio. We just can't make any reference to who did the recording, who did the writing, who did the exporting. Okay. Another thing we can see here are some parallels with the reflexive constructions in that we're using say, right, in each case, we're using say, and that the verb forms agree in number with the subjects, okay? All right, I think I ended up talking a lot more than I had planned and maybe more than you wanted to hear about the passive voice and its relation to say but hopefully that was helpful to you. Let's go on and look at the next um, use of the particle say. Say can function as an impersonal subject in active voice sentences. So here I'm going to draw a contrast between what we just saw, the passive voice and active voice sentences. The particle say is also used in constructions featuring an impersonal subject. Okay, What do I mean by impersonal subject? Well, it's pretty much the same as what we see with the generic kinds of subjects seen in English sentences like these. So here we have an impersonal or generic subject. People say it's dangerous. One leaves the tip for good service. You add the salt before the rice. They expect fog tomorrow. Okay. Um, notice, first of all, that these sentences are expressed in active voice, right? Subject, verb, 
object, subject, verb. Object, they're expressed in active voice. Okay? And I'm pointing this out because it's also true of impersonal subject constructions in Spanish. Come back to that in a second. But notice also that in cases like these, these subjects, people, one, you, they, they don't really refer to actual definite persons most of the time. They're simply occupying a required subject position, right, and function in these sentences. So guess, just take a wild guess, which ubiqu ubiquitous particle steps up to play this generic position-filling role in Spanish. That's right. It is our old friend, say, or his close but antisocial cousin, impersonal say. Okay? So, the same examples we just are looking at here in English, right? We could also express these using impersonal or generic subject um, constructions that involve the particle say. Let's take a look. For people say it's dangerous, I could say, se dice que es peligroso. Peligroso, the important parts right here. Se dice que. Se dice que es peligroso. One leaves a tip for good service. Se deja una propina. Um, por excelente, por excelente atención, okay? Se deja una propina. Again, notice, if we consider say the subject, we have subject, verb, object. Subject, verb, object. You add the salt before the rice. Se echa, o se agrega, talking about a recipe, for example. Se echa la sal antes. Se echa, se echa la sal, subject, verb, object. Se echa la sal antes de echar el arroz, por ejemplo. They expect fog tomorrow. We could say a weather forecast, right? Para mañana, para mañana, se espera, oops, se espera neblina. Para mañana, se espera neblina. Again, subject, verb, object. Se espera neblina. So at first glance, you might be thinking these look a little bit like the passive say uh, constructions we looked at in the previous se uh, segment. But let's not be so easily confused, amigos, okay? If we keep in mind that the particle say, again, is actually functioning as the subject, okay, we quickly realize, like I've mentioned a few times, that we're looking at the same active voice, not passive, subject, verb, object, syntax, okay? Also, and this is key, the verb following say, the verb following say, okay, agrees with say. In other words, it is always, always in impersonal say constructions, 100% of the time conjugated in the third person singular, regardless of what follows, whether it's some kind of a clause, um, a plural group of people. It's always, the verb is always singular because it agrees with this singular subject. Now, in some cases, in some cases, the noun in a particular sentence could legitimately be seen as either a subject or as a direct object. Okay, let me just, against my better judgment, because this is really opening up a can of worms, but for you grammar geeks out there, against my better judgment, you might have seen this sign around town. Se habla español. So what I'm saying is, Sometimes this noun in a construction like this could be legitimately conceived of as either a direct object, say, habla español, subject, verb, direct object, or as the subject of a passive construction. So in cases like these, when you have a singular uh, noun, it becomes really difficult, if not impossible, depending on the perspective, to distinguish between say passive and impersonal say, or reflexive say for that matter. However, I do not recommend falling victim to this, um, nothing against Spanish, I love Spanish, falling victim to this obsession of trying to sort out these distinctions between the impersonal and the passive say. Uh, it's literally giving me, given me nightmares over the past few months. Okay, So that's a topic for another possibly pointless video lesson. Let's just move on to our final and last use of say. Okay, and the final use of say that I want to cover today is actually just a variation on the use of the 
passive say or say passive construction that we just talked about a few minutes ago. And that is that say is used in what are often called no fault say constructions, but which could just as easily be called passive constructions that like to incorporate indirect object pronouns to allude to the guilty or affected party. Okay, maybe not just as easily. Let's look at some examples of these before I go into an explanation. Okay, so I've written on the whiteboard uh, several of these no-fault say so-called um, constructions. Let's take a look at them. First one is se nos acabó la gasolina. So we have say and the verb, say and the verb, but in between we're inserting an indirect object pronoun. Se nos acabó la gasolina. We ran out of gas, or literally the gas, which is the actual subject, right? The subjects are all at the end. El juguete, el toy, el dinero, the money, los libros, las llaves, the keys, los vasos, the glasses. Again, pay attention to whether they are singular or masculine because that's what dictates whether this verb is in the singular or the plural. I'm sorry, singular or plural, okay? Plural for these plural subjects down here. So again, we have say, verb, say, verb with a an indirect object pronoun in the middle. Se me rompió el juguete, right? The toy broke. The may is in there to indicate either who broke the toy, but to take the edge off the association of guilt or intention, right? Se rompió el juguete. The toy broke kind of like in my vicinity. I happened to be around when the toy broke. Sorry, right? Or se acabó la gasolina. The gas ran out on us unsuspecting poor us, right? So no fault say or unplanned say. Se te perdió el libro, el dinero, excuse me. Se te perdió el dinero, se te perdió el dinero. Um, did you lose the money? Was the money lost and did it affect you? Was the money lost? That's our passive construction. Was the money lost? Se perdió el dinero, but the te indicates to you, did it happen to you? Se les quedaron los libros en casa. Here, les could be representing something like the students, right? The students left their books at home. Only we're not saying that they left them. We're not using an active uh, construction. We're not saying los, los estudiantes dejaron sus libros en casa. We're saying se les quedaron. They were left at home and it happened to the students, okay? Similarly, se me olvidaron las, las llaves. Se me olvidaron las llaves, okay? I left my keys at home, only I'm not saying I left them, them at home, I'm saying they were left at home and this affected me. I was the victim, not the doer. Se me olvidaron las llaves, okay? One final example, se le cayeron los vasos. I'm not saying the waiters, se les, right? The waiters, a los camareros o a los meseros. Se les cayeron los vasos. I'm not saying that they dropped them, right? No los dejaron caer. I'm not saying they dropped them. I'm saying they fell in the vicinity of the waiters, right? You've seen this happen. Se cayeron los vasos. So we have a passive construction and we're inserting an indirect object pronoun to say to whom this happened or who was affected by this, by this action. So in these constructions, right, we're inserting just to review indirect object pronoun between the particle say and the main verb the effect of this insertion is to indicate to whom the event happened. And as we've just discussed, this is why this is sometimes called the no-fault say or even the unplanned event say, because the person involved is not being cast actively or purposefully as having done something with a negative outcome, like breaking the toy or running out of gas or losing the money or forgetting the keys, right? Rather, as something more like a victim or the person affected by an unexpected and unplanned occurrence. Now it's worth also pointing out that the no fault say um, most often occurs when narrating in the preterite tense, but you could also see it in the present perfect. Se nos ha acabado la gasolina. Se me ha roto el juguete. Se te ha perdido el dinero. Se les han quedado los libros en casa. Again, though, the verb always agreeing with the subject, okay? Singular or plural. All right, well, that concludes my presentation on some of the most common uses of this little particle, say, in Spanish. I hope that you found it to be informative and useful. As always, I welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions. So if you do have a minute, please do uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you thought about this particular video lesson. 
And if you like this video, I do hope you'll check out my other uh, lessons on various topics in Spanish and Portuguese. You can also find more content on my website at professorjason.com and receive even more frequent Professor Jason updates by liking my Facebook community or following me on Twitter. And I'm going to put that information up on the screen here in just a second. Thanks again for watching. This has been Professor Jason, your guide to Spanish. I'll see you at the next lesson. Hasta pronto. Ciao.